Good morning. We are reading from Luke 1, 1 to 4 first. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Continuing at verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Thank you, Sharon. Last Sunday, we looked at the angel visiting Mary and sharing with her this terrifying and exciting news that she had been found to have favor with the Lord and that the Holy Spirit would come upon her, that she would conceive in her virgin womb and would bear a son, the Son of God. And so we continue now in Luke's Gospel. Immediately after having experienced this, Mary decides to go and visit her cousin Elizabeth in the hill country of Judea. And so, uh, because Elizabeth now is six months pregnant. And I, we're not sure if, if Mary already knew about Elizabeth's pregnancy or if it was because the angel had told Mary about her cousin even in her old age, now being pregnant as well. But anyway, Mary decides that she is going to make this trip to visit her cousin Elizabeth in the hill country of Judea and her husband. And so uh, let's uh, take a minute to look at this map. Normally when I show you a map to give you a sense of uh, where things are in the, the Holy Land, uh, I use a, an ancient map from Jesus' day or from Old Testament times, whatever the case may be. But today I thought it would be important to show you this map, which is a, a more modern map. And you can see the countries of Syria and Jordan. And uh, it's, uh, it's just interesting to note. You see Nazareth there near the top. And so Mary uh, would have had to travel down to the hill country surrounding Jerusalem. There's a, there's a mountain chain or a hill chain which runs north to south. And it goes through Jerusalem and Bethlehem and extends quite a ways uh, uh, that the length of the country. Um, but we don't know exactly where uh, Elizabeth was living at the time, but somewhere in the greater Jerusalem area. And so Mary made this pilgrimage. It's, if, if you want to you know, fly there, it's about uh, 70 miles. Uh, but of course, the, the roads don't go straight, especially with the hills. And so it would have been an, about an 85 mile trip, uh, which is about 140 kilometers, which would have taken the better part of a week. Now, it, I also happen to notice that uh, if you traveled into Syria, 
uh, it's about the same distance to the city of Damascus. And uh, it's just been a real blessing getting to know our Syrian families, and uh, I talked with them uh, about this message uh, a few weeks ago because I knew I would be uh, preparing it, and I wanted to find out about their, you know, Christmas traditions and their understanding of this text, and it's just uh, fascinating for me uh, to realize how close Syria is to, to Nazareth and to so much of the events in our, our Bible. Uh, I encourage you to, to talk to them about uh, such things when you are with them again. She's making this trip, and she's going to see Elizabeth and Zechariah, and they, Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. Elizabeth and Zechariah had been faithful, holy people of the Lord throughout their days, but they had never had any children. We, we skipped over this uh, part of, of Luke's gospel, it's, it's earlier, and and even in their old age, perhaps they were 40, even in their old age, uh, they were given this, this son. And so Elizabeth is six months pregnant. And the, the child that they're about to have is John, who became John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer. You remember John. John was the one who went out in the wilderness and wore a, you know, a coat made of camel's hair. You, know, you remember John. He was the one that, that ate the locust and the wild honey. Uh, John was the one that... that prophesied in the wilderness, you know, make straight the path for the Lord. Uh, let every mountain go down and every hill, or sorry, every hill go down and every valley rise up and make straight his ways. You remember John the Baptist. He was the one who people came to him at the Jordan River and were baptized by him. For a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of their sins. You remember John. John was Jesus' cousin. He was the one that Jesus himself went to to be baptized before he began his ministry. You remember John. John the Baptist was imprisoned by King Herod and beheaded. So Mary sets out, and she's vulnerable. There's no indication by Luke that anyone else traveled with her. You would think maybe Joseph, her fiancé, may have gone with her, or perhaps some other family members, but Luke doesn't mention anyone going with her. She's vulnerable. She's a teenage girl, and it doesn't matter what age or society teenage girls have lived in, teenage girls have been vulnerable. Joseph could decide to not go through with the marriage at any point. She's vulnerable because by Jewish law, she could be stoned to death by being pregnant out of marriage. But she makes her way 85 miles on foot or by donkey, about the same trip and about the same distance as she would make nine months later on their way to Bethlehem. And when she arrives, she sees her cousin Elizabeth and she calls out to her. And at the, the, the sound of Mary's greeting to Elizabeth, this six-month-old child in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. The Holy Spirit is at work in the midst of these two women and their children. The Holy Spirit leaps in her womb. Now, as a man, I can't imagine what it feels like to have a child within me, let alone moving and kicking. You know, I had actually two turkey dinners yesterday, so by the, the time I got home after the second one, I had a bit of that <laughs> kicking and stuff. But, it, that's probably not nearly as exciting <laughs> as having a baby within you. You know, a, a little Tums or, or Rolades won't fix that, right? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is upon Mary and her cousin Elizabeth and baby John yet to be born in Elizabeth's womb. And Elizabeth, she experiences, experiences the movement of her unborn son. The Holy Spirit comes upon her and she says to her cousin Mary, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child in your womb. Mary, you know, just a few days or weeks earlier was, I'm sure, living a happy and simple life. A peasant girl from the town of Nazareth engaged to a carpenter and all of a sudden, her world got turned upside down. 
The angel came. She was now pregnant. All kinds of doubt and confusion. All kinds of wonders as to whether or not this was real. Whether, who knows what would happen to her. Who knows what would happen to her child. Often in our lives, when something dramatic happens, we have to grow up really quickly. You know, if we're uh, young, when a parent dies, or we get really sick, or there's a serious accident, it causes us to mature and grow up really quickly. And I'm sure that's exactly what Mary was experiencing during these uh, traumatic days. And there's a, a mother's intuition, there's a mother's knowledge, and there's a... a, a a maturity that comes upon most people when they experience those kinds of life events. I'm sure that as Mary was making her way south to visit her older cousin Elizabeth, she was thinking about the women of old in the scriptures. She would have thought of Hannah and how a thousand years before Hannah had been barren in her old age. And she prayed to the Lord that she might have a child, and the Lord answered her prayers. And she gave birth to Samuel, one of Israel's great prophets. And so, when the two greet each other, and Elizabeth understands by the gift of the Holy Spirit just what is happening here, not just her pregnancy, but how Mary, her cousin, is now pregnant. Blessed are you among women. It would have been very easy for Mary to let that kind of compliment and blessing go to her head. But she's had some days to process this. She's had some time to reflect and to pray, to think about Hannah of generations before and how Hannah's response was to not take it upon herself, but to thank the Lord, to pour all the glory and the praise back to God who gives the gift of children, to give the praise and thanks to God for his blessings without whom we are nothing. And so Mary doesn't receive Elizabeth's blessing and say, thank you. This is how she responds. Let's look at verse 46. Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, not because of who I am, but because of what the Lord has done in blessing me. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, Holy is his name. And she goes on. This is Mary's response. And it's become known as the Magnificat. How many of you are familiar with that term, the Magnificat? Because that's the first word in Latin of Mary's response. It comes from the word magnify or glorify or, or praise the Lord. The Roman Catholics, the priests are to say Mary's Magnificat every evening. It's a part of many worship liturgies. Many people throughout the Christian faith have this memorized. Mary's humble response. She glorifies the Lord. It's very easy for us when people thank us or praise us to accept that praise. Last Sunday we had our monthly potluck supper here at the church, and I was sitting beside somebody, and I was thanking them for this delicious food that they, they brought, this particular dish that I was enjoying. And they jokingly said how, you know, they'd slaved away all afternoon making it, and I clued in that they'd actually bought it from a store. It was from M&M's or something, <laughs> right? Every Sunday after worship, I go to the front door, and, and some of you head out that way, and you thank me for the worship service. And I have a lot of difficulty with that because I want to give the thanks and praise to God. I want you to be giving the thanks and praise to God, not thanking me. You can, you know, thank me, but, but don't think that I've done anything special or wonderful. I'm just here to worship the Lord like you. 
Mary deflects Elizabeth's praise and blessing. Blessed are you among women. I agree, the Lord is blessing me, but I give all the praise and thanks to him, is Mary's response. She's experiencing a love, a confirmation of what the Holy Spirit of God is doing in her life by Elizabeth's response, by the work of the Holy Spirit, and she's giving it all right back to the Lord. I can only sort of identify that with perhaps, a, you know, the day of my wedding, and I hope you can identify with this too, where I was surrounded with family and friends who were there to just love me and bless me and rejoice with me, and I realized that this is not simply about me or Angie. This is about the, the love that is, is felt and experienced within family and friendships and community. Perhaps you've also experienced it when a family member has died and you felt the outpouring of love and support and prayers and blessings by family and friends. Whether it's at the, the service, whether it's in the gift of meals and care afterward, Perhaps some of you have experienced when you've been away from church for a number of weeks because of illness or surgery or something, and you come back and you experience that encompassing love and joy and acceptance and support from your church family again. I hope all of us experience that kind of love and blessing at various points in our lives, but that we don't think that it's all about us. It's about what God is doing for us, in us, and through us. And we give all the praise, all the thanks, all the glory, like Mary, back to him. As I looked at this passage this morning, there was one thing that caught my eye that I hadn't noticed before. So I just want to leave you with this. The very last verse that we read. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. What I hadn't clued into was the fact that Elizabeth, when Mary came, was six months pregnant. You can do the math. So it's very likely that Mary wouldn't have left within a few days or a few weeks before John was born. Mary would have stayed with her cousin. She would have been there to, to experience the birth, to have seen what she was in for six months to come. We can't imagine what was going through her heart and mind during those days and months, the joy, the fear, the peace, the worry, but we look to Mary as a wonderful example of a, a faithful woman who bore the Son of God and in doing so humbled herself, giving all the praise and the glory back to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.